Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions. And question number one, Claire Baker, please. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with Transport Scotland regarding the Leave Mouth Rail project. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Transport Scotland officials have met regularly with Fife Council officers and the appointed consultants at Peter Brett's Associates during the course of the Leaving Mouth Sustainable Transport Study. The Leaving Mouth Rail Link is one of the options being considered as part of that study. Uh, the most recent meeting took place on the 12th of September. Claire Baker. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and can I also welcome him to his new role. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will hopefully be aware of the very active Leave Mouth Rail campaign. Leave Mouth is the largest conurbation in Scotland that does not have a rail line and is an area with below average car ownership. The reintroduction of a rail service would offer passenger as well as freight and would bring huge economic, educational, social and cultural opportunities for the area which is in need of investment. The campaign for the rail link's reintroduction has the support of Fife Council, as the Cabinet Secretary recognises, and politicians from across all parties who are convinced it should be a priority investment for the government. Will the Cabinet Secretary... No, no, Secretary, please question. I hope this is the question. This is, is the it? question. Thank you. President Officer, thank you. Will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with me and other interested MSPs to discuss the future of the project at the earliest opportunity and to understand the cross-party consensus that are behind the plans? Claire Baker. Oh, Claire Baker. I'm so sorry. Cab I'm sorry, Claire Baker. Cabinet Secretary. It's hard. <laughs> I'm more than happy if Claire Baker wants to answer the questions this afternoon, so uh, if she chooses to do so. Uh, can I say, is that a yes? <laughs> but uh, can I say I'm very aware of the very active campaign from the uh, Leave and Mouth uh, uh, group who are keen to see the uh, line reopened. And the member will be aware of the considerable amount of work that's already been taken forward by uh, uh, Transport Scotland, Fife Council, and also working with the uh, with the campaign group in looking at this particular uh, issue. And I recognise the importance it can have to communities such as Leaving Mouth and the benefits that can potentially come from uh, the re, uh, uh, opening of uh, this particular line. Can I say to the member, it is important that we make sure that all of the stakeholders who have a part to play in looking at this issue are working uh, collectively together. That's Transport Scotland, Fife Council and other parties who have an interest to uh, play in that. And I've been encouraged by the way in which that's been getting taken forward uh, to date. I'm also very conscious from the work that Fife Council are doing with Transport Scotland that they're keen to see how further progress can be made with the matter. So on the point that the member made regarding uh, would I be willing to meet with uh, herself and other MSPs, um, I, of course I'm more than happy to look at doing that at some point. It's important that the existing work that's been carried out at the present moment is concluded so that we can look at it on the basis of where we go next and what the next steps would be. Uh, but I've been very encouraged by the way in which the work has been taken forward to date and I'm more than happy to discuss that with other colleagues in Parliament and how we can make further progress with this matter. Jenny Gilruth. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I have another invitation for the Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to invite him to meet with me in Leaven so that he can see for himself the benefits of reinstating uh, the rail link uh, to the town. Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, it's been a while since I've been in Leaven, so I'll have to take up that offer uh, from Jenny Gilruth. And uh, I recognise that the interest that she has in this matter um, as well. But it's, um, um, I would like to encourage all MSPs who have a collective interest in this matter to work in a, a cooperative fashion. And I will certainly do what I can in making sure that we continue to make progress with this particular proposal. Of course, it is important that it goes through the proper due process uh, in making decisions about these matters. Uh, any decision for investment into the opening of a line or investment into a line has to be based on evidence that would justify that as being the most appropriate way in which to help to improve transport connectivity in that particular area. Uh, and that's the case for railways, roads and other major transport um, investments. But I've, of course, I'm more than happy to uh, meet with General Garuth in our constituency and to, uh, and to discuss this matter in further detail with other MSPs at a later date. Question two, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of households in the Stirling constituency have faster broadband connectivity. Minister. Uh, based on figures provided by independent broadband analysts, I think broadband, 95.1% of all premises in the Stirling constituency area are now able to access fibre broadband, and 89.1% are able to access super fast speeds of 30 megabits per second and above. 
When deployment through the Digital Scotland Supervised Broadband Programme began in January 2014, just 59.8% of premises were able to access fibre and 57.7% at speeds of 30 megabits per second and above. The latest assured figures show that over 16,200 premises in the Stirling constituency now have access to fibre broadband as a direct result of the programme and over 14,000 of those at speeds of 24 megabits per second and above. Bruce Crawford. I thank the, the, cabinet secretary, sorry, the Minister for his reply. Uh, is he aware that there are still a significant number of my constituents and the Stirling constituents who do not have yet access to the fast broadband? And while I'm delighted that the Scottish Government will soon be letting the contract for R100 to ensure 100% of coverage for faster broadband by the end of 2021, can I ask the Minister if he's aware that the communities of Crane, Larrick and Tyndrum were potentially within scope in regard to the current contract for which BT is responsible and in that regard, therefore, can he update me on what the prospects for the communities of Crane, Larrick and Tyndrum are of being connected to foster faster broadband in the near future? Minister. I well, thank uh, Mr Crawford for his, his question. Uh, certainly, as, as he's aware that uh, the Scottish Government has uh, responded to the, the, the failure, if you like, of the UK market uh, approach that's been taken by UK ministers and has stepped in uh, in the intervention he described in terms of our 100 programme and indeed the uh, Superfast programme under the DSSB or uh, Digital Scotland Superfast broadband programme. And we, we have intervened for the reasons of the concern about the impact on economic development in communities such as Pre and Lark, uh, which uh, Mr Crawford describes. I understand that officials within the DSSB team recently provided an update to Strathfillan uh, Community Council on broadband in Cree and Larrach, in which they stated that planners continue to work on finding a solution that would allow Strathfillan to be covered under the DSSB programme. But I am, of course, happy to uh, correspond with, with Mr. Crawford in further detail on that, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Can I remind members and front bench of crisp supplementaries and um, crisp answers and replies? Uh, question three, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it plans to improve the trunk road network in South Scotland region. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the contract for the construction of 30 million the £30 million mobile by mob uh, Mabel Bypass is expected to be awarded by the end of this year. When completed, this project will improve road safety and journey time reliability along the A77, including to the port at Cairn Ryan. Looking to the future, Transport Scotland recently published the draft uh, Borders Transport Corridor Study uh, report, which contained a number of recommendations for improvements to the trunk road network in the region. In the West, Transport Scotland is progressing at the South West Scotland Transport Study, with the stakeholder engagement phase launched earlier today. The emerging outcomes from both studies will provide important inputs to the forthcoming Strategic Transport Projects Review. Joe McAlpine. Thank you. I very much welcome this news. I wonder if the Scottish Government could say how much these contracts are worth, how many jobs does it see as supporting through such contracts, and can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what benefits will be reaped by local firms? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Senator Officer, the construction of the five kilometres Mabel Bypass uh, is estimated to be in the region of around £30 million. Uh, this will benefit the local community uh, as it will provide opportunities for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises to bid for subcontractor uh, roles. Uh, there are provisions uh, for at least uh, four vocational and seven uh, professional uh, on-site based uh, training opportunities. Uh, and at its peak, it's estimated that this project uh, will employ up to 165 people. Uh, that will no doubt uh, bring benefits to the local economy uh, and I've got no doubt that there will be local contractors who will be keen uh, to take up some of the subcontracting roles which come about through this contract. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased that uh, Mabel's uh, finally moving forward. But speaking of two other long uh, delayed and, uh, projects that have seen slow progress, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me when the A76 will be fully reopened and when the Scottish Government will finally get round to investing in the A75. Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, uh, the first thing to say is it's wrong to suggest that the Scottish Government has not invested in the A75. It has uh, an extensive amount of funding over a considerable period of time in order to deal with pinch points and other areas of safety, along with maintenance and uh, maintaining the line uh, over an extended period of uh, years. So though we'll continue to make sure that we make the necessary investments. As I mentioned as well, we are uh, undertaking the South West 
uh, study which will look at those wider issues that need to be addressed. Some of that will include the uh, A75 and A77 and the other uh, transport uh, net roads around that area and also the transport network as a whole. And that will feed into the uh, strategic approach that we take to transport investment. But unlike the many years of Conservative rule in this country, we are making the real investment into Scottish roads, including the A75. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given the economic challenges facing the south of Scotland, the, the nationally strategically important of the, the ferry terminal at Cairn Ryan, and what has been a chronic lack of investment in the A75, A76 and A77, surely the Cabinet Secretary accepts that the south of Scotland needs a far bigger share of investment in its trunk road network than it's had in the last few years? Cabinet Secretary. So as the member will be well aware, there's a significant amount of investment goes into the A75 and A77 as part of the maintenance contract and also where it's appropriate for upgrades to be carried out. Actually, there's some work that have been taking place over uh, recent times uh, because of restrictions that have been placed on a carriageway as carriageway replacement work has been carried out at the present uh, moment. Uh, but the member's also aware that we have commissioned the South West, West Scotland Transport Study, uh, the public consultation element of which started uh, today. Uh, that's the first phase of that uh, public engagement. There will be further phases where there will be working groups that will be established to engage with local stakeholders around what would be the most effective way now to improve connectivity and transport links to the southwest of Scotland. And that study will allow us to then make decisions about what the most appropriate action would be in the future to meet the connectivity issues that they have in the southwest of Scotland and where the necessary investments will be required. And that will then sit within the strategic transport project review. As the member recognises, it's important that we take this approach in order to have a wider look about how we can make sure that the investments we make in areas such as the southwest are addressing what the issues are and that are actually adding value and improvement to connectivity in these areas alongside the other proposals we have for transport and connectivity improvements spread across the country. Question four, Bob Doris. Government how proposals and its transport bill aim to support the improved planning and delivery of socially desirable bus routes. Cabinet Secretary. The transport bill provides local authorities with a range of tools to influence and improve, improve bus services in their area, ensuring that there are sustainable bus networks across Scotland. Uh, this includes options to pursue partnership working, local franchising or running their own buses in certain circumstances. Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The summer students in my constituency have no easy way of commuting to Clevedon Secondary School in Kelvindale, an area poorly served by bus. Whilst I hope to secure a solution, the current system where SPT tenders a socially desirable bus route is costly, of limited value and often restrictive. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that a co-production model for such bus routes, subsidised or otherwise, between communities, the council and bus companies, where a strategic approach can be taken to socially desirable bus routes would be far preferable and what can the transport bill do to address this key issue? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, um, uh, partnerships at the very centre of what we want to achieve uh, with our proposals in improving bus services in Scotland and uh, a new model for uh, local transport authorities to work with bus operators to help to revitalise services as part of the work that we are uh, taking forward. That's why we're also committed to promoting uh, positive changes and partnership uh, working to improve bus services and the best way for that to happen is uh, by getting the right partners together. So for example, um, uh, Bob Doris's suggestion of the uh, need to take these matters forward in a way which is much more based on co-production, uh, engagement and partnership uh, is essential to that, making sure that uh, bus passengers uh, are at the centre of how we design and deliver bus services uh, going forward and reflect the needs of local communities, including uh, the communities within uh, Bob Doris's constituency. Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much. Um, I've raised with the Cabinet Secretary's predecessor concerns about cuts to the bus services uh, from Gills Bay, Wick uh, to Inverness. Uh, will the Transport Bill uh, recognise that some of those socially desirable and important bus routes actually serve communities beyond uh, the place they are, they, they are in and that it would be absolutely crucial uh, going forward that um, in this instance uh, Orkney is fully involved uh, in, in any discussions about how this vital uh, bus, bus route connection to the, uh, to the ferry services is taken forward? Well, President Officer, as a member will be aware, we as a government invest some £250 million a year in bus services in Scotland through a variety of different channels, part of which is to also support local authorities uh, where uh, necessary in certain circumstances to provide uh, subsidy for a particular 
uh, routes and that will continue to be the case uh, going forward. Of course, it is for local authorities then to make a determination and a decision on where they uh, wish to, uh, to take such uh, action. Uh, the additional benefits that we provide within the Transport Bill provides additional methods uh, where uh, local authorities and other partners can consider taking action where they believe it is socially desirable uh, and necessary for a bus service to be made available where there is no commercial operator in place at the present moment. So along with the investment we are making and the additional provisions that we are uh, providing within the bill uh, for additional options uh, to be available to local communities and to local authorities, that will provide more opportunities uh, for actions to be taken at a local level as and when that's necessary. Question five, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Transport Scotland Network Rail and ScotRail regarding the East Kilbride to Glasgow rail line. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government has prioritised the East Kilbride and Barhead routes for enhancements as part of the CP6 project funding. Uh, the first part of this improvement is to run longer trains with more seats for passengers along both routes. Uh, the work necessary to deliver this is being pursued urgently and we expect to make a positive announcement soon. Transport Scotland Network Rail and ScotRail are working closely to develop plans which will deliver better resilience, more capacity, reduce emissions and major passenger benefits over the coming years. Detailed work has already commenced to assess the most economic means of delivering these outcomes. Linda Fabiani. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for that response. But could I also ask him in his meetings with the ScotRail Alliance and Transport Scotland to stress the inadequacy of the current single track line and the importance of the upgrading for such a commuter line um, to help the government's aspirations to low emissions and carbon reduction, um, the East Kilbride line as a commuter corridor for Glasgow is absolutely crucial. Cabinet Secretary. Epstein officer, I recognise the concerns which the member has uh, raised, and these are matters which the member has raised on behalf of her constituents previously uh, with me in uh, at recent times. And part of the purpose for which we are carrying out the work that's been taken forward just now is to look at how we can improve resilience and capacity on the existing uh, network, particularly on the East Kilbride and the Barhead uh, lines, which would, uh, with the objective of providing uh, uh, more seats uh, and greater reliability on those services. Uh, as part of the control period six, um, uh, what that's been taken forward, uh, we are looking at the existing infrastructure arrangements which we have in place and where those uh, strategic investments can be made in, help, in order to help to support uh, greater use of our railways, uh, greater resilience within them and reliability uh, for them. Uh, and alongside that, also making sure uh, that we provide them as a, a, a positive alternative uh, to people driving into town centres, such as from East Kilbride into at Glasgow. So the points which the member has made uh, are all points which are certainly not lost on me uh, and are, parts of, are, are points which are being considered as part of the work which has been taken forward at the present moment. Question six, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what its programme for government means for the long-term level of infrastructure spend in Edinburgh and across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Our programme for government committed to increasing infrastructure spend by around 1% of GDP this will mean that annual investment in our hospitals, schools, houses, transport, low carbon technology and digital connections will be around £1.5 billion higher by 2025-26 than 2029-20. This, this national mission will bring a level of investment in our vital economic and social infrastructure that will protect and create jobs in the short term and support growth and productivity in the long term. The City of Edinburgh will continue to benefit from investment across a range of its infrastructure, including key projects such as the St James's Quarter and the Edinburgh and South East Scotland City Region deal. Gordon MacDonald, I think it must be briefly, please. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, the commitment infrastructure is to be 1.5 billion per year higher by 25-26 
means support for faster broadband schools and improved transport in my constituency. It's practical benefits for my constituents. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that in such times of Tory-induced uncertainty, such ambitious plans help ensure investments that will benefit future generations? Briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary, if you've got to move on uh, to the next Officer, set of I agree questions. With the, I agree with the sentiments of uh, the Member's uh, point there. The ambitions that we've set out as part of our national infrastructure mission is to make sure that we continue to deliver the major infrastructure investment that Scotland needs for the future. By increasing our investment in this area, it puts Scotland much more in line with other uh, developed countries and the level of investment that's necessary to make sure that we have a modern, fit-for-purpose infrastructure. And the programme that we've set out just demonstrates the ambition that this SNP government have for making sure we deliver that for Scotland in the years ahead. Thank you. I apologise to the four members I didn't manage to reach, notwithstanding uh, my mantra that if we have shorter supplementaries and shorter answers, everyone gets in. So perhaps that can be taken, as they say, on board. And now turn to questions on justice and law officers. Question one, Alexander Stewart, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to recent figures from the Scottish Prison Service showing record levels of disorder, drug taking and fire raising in prisons. Cabinet Secretary. Just say that uh, prison officers, of course, have the right to work in their workplace, just as all, is, all, of, all of us do, uh, free from assault. We recognise the importance of providing a safe and secure environment for those in custody, as well as, of course, as I say, the men and women who work in our prisons. Our prisons are dealing with increasingly complex populations, including an increase in serious and organised crime groups and those under the influence of unknown substances who all present an increased risk of disorder. In relation to the recent statistics uh, that have been published, a National Strategic Risk and Threat Group has been established by the Scottish Prison Service in response to increasing levels of violence against those uh, in its care or indeed against staff within our prisons. Uh, just to put it as a note of context, compared with England and Wales, Scotland's response to disorder in our prisons does perform favourably. The latest figure from England and Wales shows that rates of assault on staff are 223% higher uh, in England and Wales uh, at 84 per 1,000 prisoners compared to 26 per 1,000 in Scotland, but I suspect I speak for everybody in the chamber when I say that is 26 per 1,000 too many. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Official figures show that 37,518 punishments were given to inmates in 2017-18. This is a rise of over 9,000 since the SNP came to power. So what urgent measures is the Cabinet Secretary now putting in place to combat the growing disorder within our prisons? Cabinet Secretary. Can I just refer to my, my previous answer, which is that uh, SPS, Scottish Prison Service, have taken immediate action, that is to establish a national strategic risk and threat group. When I spoke to Colin McConnell and indeed Phil Fairley from the, the Prison Officers, uh, Officers Association, uh, both of them uh, told me that there was complex reasons uh, and some of those I've referred to in, in my first answer. Uh, it should also be said of, of the 448 separate incidents involving violence against staff over the last two years, 40% of those were perpetrated by individuals that had identified mental health issues. So this is much more complex than uh, I think we have time to, to, to answer in this question. I would say uh, David Stewart, uh, Alexander Stewart's uh, question uh, does give me the opportunity uh, to raise uh, the HMIP P report, uh, which he would have seen uh, from David Strang uh, today, which uh, of course uh, gave a, uh, certainly raised some challenges uh, for our prison estate, but generally uh, spoke, I thought, in very positive terms. And, it say, and, and David Strang, just to quote the report directly, said, uh, we should never take for granted the good order that is maintained in Scotland's prison and that they are in a general, stable and secure environment. And I uh, just say that's in stark contrast, uh, contrast to Peter Clark, the Chief Inspector of Prisons for England and Wales, uh, in his annual report in July, who said, uh, and I quote, some of the most disturbing prison conditions we have ever seen. Uh, there are conditions which have no place in the advanced nation in the 21st century. Uh, in this, my third annual report is HM, Chief Inspector of Prisons for England and Wales, violence, drugs, suicide and self-harm, squalor and poor access to education are again prominent themes. So that contrast uh, is there, but of course we should never and can never, and we won't be complacent. Daniel Johnson. Thank you. Can I associate myself with the remarks around prison officers who do do fantastic work? New psychoactive substances are a real and growing problem in our prisons. So can I ask, given that they are so hard to detect, what support is the Scottish Government providing the SPA to develop new techniques and technologies to detect psychoactive substances coming into our prisons? 
Cabinet Secretary. I'll ask um, SPS to be able to give a, a more detailed uh, answer on the work that they are doing uh, to the member in, in, in written form. But that, that is exactly the type of uh, issue uh, that the newly established National Strategic Risk and Threat Group will look into. As I mentioned in my conversations with SPS and indeed the POA, uh, that the unknown substances uh, were certainly uh, one of the factors that were giving them cause for alarm. But I'll get a written response uh, from SPS Direct in terms of some of this, uh, the measures that they are taking to, to, to combat this issue. Question two, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, uh, uh, Presiding Officer. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government how current reconviction rates compare with 2006 7. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, reconviction rates in Scotland are now at a 19 year low and have reduced to 27% compared to 32% in 2006 7. That means that over the last 10 years, there's been a shift from around one in three offenders being reconvicted to around one in four. Uh, the average number of reconvictions per offender is also at its lowest level for 19 years and is 22% lower than it was in 2006 7 The figures published earlier this month uh, also show that individuals released from a custodial sentence of 12 months or less are reconvicted nearly twice as often as those who receive a community payback order. And we continue to work to create a just, safe and resilient Scotland and these figures reinforce the value of an evidence-led collaborative approach to reduce the use of short-term imprisonment, uh, prevent reoffending, and promote rehabilitation. Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Uh, could the Cabinet Secretary outline what are the factors employed that have caused the dramatic and, I must say, welcome outcome? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, there will be many uh, of them, but I think this government's focus on rehabilitation, on understanding uh, that uh, community payback orders, that community justice, uh, certainly for the rehabilitation element, um, um, it's, it's certainly for rehabilitation, uh, pay, pay dividends. So we'll continue to invest uh, heavily in community justice. Uh, we have done, uh, for example, we've allocated around 100 million per annum to local authorities to deliver community sentences and reduce reoffending. Uh, and what I would say to, to, to parties across the chamber uh, is that we should never look at victims' uh, rights, which we're going to strengthen and continue to strengthen at the heart of our justice system, uh, and, and the rehabilitation of offenders as being uh, two, two uh, conflicting uh, narratives or, or indeed measures. They are not. They are two sides, I would say, uh, very much of the same coin. So I think, uh, I would hope everybody would look at the data, uh, see where we've had success in reducing uh, reconvictions and reoffending, and hopefully we can get a parliamentary consensus around the way uh, forward, which includes, for example, a presumption against short sentences of 12 months and more. Liam Kerr. And less. Thank you, President Officer. But does the Cabinet Secretary not agree with me that given that the reconviction rate has actually fallen less than five percentage points over that 18 years and is still a third higher than in Northern Ireland, there's simply no room for complacency? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, of course I would agree with uh, his assessment that th there's no room for complacency and I hope I'm not demonstrating any of that complacency. I'm suggesting that we look at the uh, justice analytics, we look at the data, the empirical evidence uh, in front of us and what I would say genuinely to, to, to Liam Kerr having spoken to him on, on a number of occasions now about this agenda I think it's so so important uh, that whatever we do uh, moving forward uh, whether it's in government or indeed uh, opposition measures that we do so looking at the data of what works and hopefully we can build a parliamentary consensus because there is an undeniable and unrefutable evidence that, that exists that community payback orders community sentences uh, certainly help with uh, tackling reoffending much better than short-term prison sentences. So when it comes to a presumption against short uh, sentences of 12 months or less, uh, I would hope that the Conservative benches will give the support to that measure. Question three, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to ensure that rape victims are given support throughout the investigation process and after the sentence of sentencing of their attacker. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, rape and sexual assault are serious crimes and anyone uh, who has been affected should, be, should feel uh, able to, to report these to the police and know that they will be supported uh, through the justice process. In uh, 2015 to 2018, the Scottish Government provided an additional 1.85 million to support uh, this project. Uh, and in 2018, we agreed an additional 1.7 million for the next two years to ensure that local rape crisis centres can continue to provide direct support to women who are engaged with the criminal justice system. Uh, in the recent PFG, we confirmed that a further 1.5 million over three years has been awarded through the Equalities Budget to Rape Crisis Scotland to speed up access to other supports such as counselling. Uh, the funding beginning from October, the funding begins in, uh, from October so it can start to make a difference uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, in addition, 1.1 million of additional funding has also been provided in the current year to the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service uh, and Court Service to improve how sexual offences cases are handled and improve communication uh, with victims. And finally, uh, through the victim of the, uh, the work of the Chief Medical Officers Task Force, uh, we're also improving care pathways 
for people who require forensic medical examination, uh, we published uh, national standards in December 2017, which are underpinned by 2.25 million pounds of Scottish Government funding. Julia Martin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does he agree with me that the continuity of police personnel is vital in such cases and that all victims, especially younger women who might be over 16, but maybe still in school and still very young, should be given the option to be accompanied by another adult throughout police interviews? And I ask because in some cases in my constituency this hasn't always been the case. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'd like to maybe perhaps talk uh, afterwards to Gillian Martin about the specific experiences of that uh, individual case because uh, certainly from all of the partners that I've spoken to involved in the criminal uh, justice system from uh, the moment that a, a terrible incident uh, like this happens, a terrible crime uh, like this happens, uh, right from there, right through to, of course, uh, investigations, uh, the trial, post the trial, sentencing, uh, release of, of, of the perpetrator. Throughout that entire process, I've identified uh, where there are, certainly in, in this early stage, where there are potential gaps. And uh, clearly for the most vulnerable witnesses and victims, where we have made some significant progress, if there are uh, gaps there, then I'm very keen that we work collaboratively uh, with all the justice partners involved uh, to ensure that we plug those gaps as best as possible. But I'd be happy to speak to Gillian Martin about the individual case, uh, just to get a little bit more information to understand uh, and inform my thinking moving forward. Question four, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will commit to an independent review of football policing. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, there are around 5 million supporters at football matches uh, every year in Scotland. The vast majority of football fans in Scotland are a credit to their teams and only a small, tiny number uh, of incidents in comparison to total numbers uh, at attending games. Now, operational policing is, of course, entirely a matter for Police Scotland. Uh, Police Scotland keep the policing of football matches under constant review and the tactics and deployments used will vary dependent on the circumstances and indeed the risk associated with each match. Uh, public safety is paramount and the Scottish Government supports Police Scotland to take appropriate and proportionate action in response to any situation where it is considered any criminality uh, may arise. Uh, there is a general framework for Police Scotland's approach uh, to football policing and Police Scotland work closely with clubs to develop policing plans. These arrangements are working well and therefore in my view there's uh, no need for an independent review. James Kelly. As a football supporter, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that so far this season we have had police filming fans at a low-level question, at a low-level friendly, serious questions about uh, crowd management at the Celtic Rangers games and reports in the Herald on Sunday of police officers approaching fans, asking them to ask as paid informants. There's widespread concern amongst football fans about, about these instances. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that football supporters have the right to be respected and to support their team and that an independent review of policing at football would progress that respect uh, amongst both parties? Cabinet Secretary. Can I, can I um, just take each of the points in turn, but before I do that, can, can I um, just say to James Kelly, I absolutely agree, of course, that football fans and any sports fans uh, getting about their business, uh, of course, uh, should be allowed to do so and enjoy that leisurely activity. And, 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 and my belief is that they very much are without uh, police involvement. And the vast, vast, vast majority of football fans that attend a football match on a Saturday and Sunday, uh, or indeed a European game uh, through, throughout the week, uh, will never have a police interaction. Or if they do, it will be an absolute minimal police interaction. So the vast majority of football fans go about, get to watch their team play, uh, and, 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 and don't have an interaction uh, with the police. Let me take each of the points in turn uh, that he mentioned. I disagree with his, his, his premise. I don't think there is widespread concern. I don't know the last time uh, James Kelly went to a football match, but when I did, uh, certainly nobody approached me about the fact that they had major, major concerns uh, in and around uh, football. So I don't think there's a widespread uh, at all. Uh, but what I would say is in terms of, uh, he described uh, filming of uh, fans, at, at, at he, uh, his words were quote unquote, a low level friendly. Uh, is his suggestion that there wouldn't be sectarian chanting just because a game happens to be a low level friendly? Uh, what I would say is Police Scotland gave evidence to the Justice Committee, uh, to this parliament to say that of course filming uh, of football fans uh, was helpful for them to gather evidence when there was uh, sectarian uh, singing and, and, and that again is an operational matter for them so uh, that is the reason for that. When it came to the, the, the Celtic Rangers match uh, and some of the issues uh, around there, uh, I believe that Celtic are carrying an independent review and have got a consultant on board for that. Police Scotland have also said that they will uh, review their measures uh, for the incident that took place. I, I also have concerns uh, about uh, that. And in terms of his last point and point of um, 
informants. Uh, what I would say is, uh, you know, looking at the Sunday Herald article which he quoted, uh, just to quote one of the fans, who obviously wasn't, didn't go by his own name, but one of the fans uh, said that the police came to, to his door. I'm sorry, Captain. And I know, I, I know, I know how important, important this I know, and I've let you have a long go at it, and I've been... Forgive me if you sit down for a minute. I appreciate you sit down for a minute. I appreciate that many are new to their positions on the front bench. I'm getting very long answers. And I'm not getting through many questions. Very few supplementaries. So you can be very brief now, please. Oh, well, it's, it's the third point that was raised. I was asked effectively three or four questions, presiding <laughs> officer. So I'm going through through each of them. Um, and 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 the question, uh, the, the quote from from the football fan was, the police were there wanting to know if there was going to be any organised fights or if there was going to be groups of people traveling to certain places, if I knew that information, could I share it? That is hardly heavy-handed policing tactics. When it comes to using human informants, that is regulated by IPCO. If the member has any concerns, of course, he can raise them directly with the, invest, uh, with the independent investigatory powers commissioner's office. Thank you. Uh, question five, Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking in response to the reported increase in incidents of antisocial behavior. Minister. The evidence points towards a long-term and sustained reduction in antisocial behaviour. The Scottish Crime and Justice Survey showed in 2008-9 that 46% of adults felt people behaved in an antisocial manner in their area, but by 2016-17 this had fallen to 29%. More adults than ever before feel safe walking alone after dark in their local area, which is sure, I'm sure is something that the member will welcome. It is, of course, very important that people feel safe in their communities, and for that reason, we are taking forward a number of actions which are contributing to this downward trend and will continue it, including refreshing our guidance to police and local authorities, supporting the extension of our whole systems approach to tackle youth offending, and ensuring that initiatives such as cashback are focused on the communities that are hit by crime and antisocial behaviour. Thank you. Jamie Halker Jones. I thank the Minister for that answer and I welcome where uh, antisocial behaviour has reduced but according to Police Scotland man management information figures in my uh, parts of my region like Murray, antisocial behaviour has increased significantly, in Murray's case 25% in a single year and with pressure on local authority budgets across Scotland we've seen the number of community wardens cut in many council areas so will the Minister confirm whether she is monitoring the deployment of community wardens centrally and whether the police are actively responding to, those, to these changes in areas where wardens, uh, warden numbers have fallen? Minister. Um, I will allow, ask my officials to look into the issue of community wardens. Um, the 2017-18 report suggest, uh, did suggest a slight increase overall in antisocial behaviour. However, the report for this first quarter, which is 2018-19, which was published quite recently just in August, suggests that reports fell from 90,052 in April to June 2017 to 90,986 in April to June 2018. So looking at this figure overall, we can see that they do indicate a long-term and sustained reduction in reports. Question six, Rona McKay. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to reduce the number of women being placed on remand. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I firstly thank Rona Mackay and all those who contributed to the Justice Committee's inquiry into the use of remand in Scotland, uh, which was published shortly before summer recess and I responded to uh, on the 23rd of August. As the committee report acknowledged, Issues impacting on the remand population go beyond justice and can res result in disruption to individuals and families, which is comparable to a short custodial sentence. Uh, decisions on each case are, of course, rightly a matter for the court to make within the overall legal framework provided by this parliament, and remand is necessary in some cases. We're working very closely with partners across portfolios to help ensure the needs of the remand population are recognised and that remand is only used where necessary and appropriate. This includes actions specific to women on remand, including providing additional funding of 1.5 million per annum for bail support services specifically for women and support for the SHINE mentoring service for women on remand. As confirmed in the programme for government, we will issue revised guidance and provide additional funding for su su supervised and supported bail. Uh, and the forthcoming debate on the Justice Committee's report will of course provide an opportunity to debate these issues in more detail. Rona McKay. Thank you for the answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary therefore agree with me that alternative methods to custody, such as holistic support and community sentences, should be offered to women, given that 75% of women remanded do not go on to be sentenced? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, knowing your uh, want for brevity, uh, President Officer, yes, I very much agree with, with Rona Mackay. Uh, and, and the government certainly has recognised that for many years. Uh, we, of course, are taking forward uh, a number of measures uh, as per uh, Elish uh, Angelini's uh, commission on, on women offenders. Uh, I can give the, answer a fuller, uh, give the member a fuller response in writing to some of the measures that we're taking forward in that regard. But absolutely, I agree with the premise uh, of her question. If everything can be brief, Margaret Mitchell, I'll call you as number seven. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met with the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission. Briefly, Minister. I met with Jim Martin, the Chair of the Scottish Legal Com uh, Complaints Commission, on the 21st of August as part of a series of introductory meetings with a range of stakeholders. And Scottish Government officials have regular engagement with the SLCC to discuss legal services policy. Yep. Uh, Margaret can, Mitchell. Thank you for that. Can the Minister confirm who scrutinises the work of the SLCC and holds them to account for its performance? <coughs> thank you, Ms Mitchell. Minister. Well, it is obviously um, an independent commission. Um, we are at the moment undertaking um, a review of the regulation of legal services and the work of the commission will and com complaints handling in particular will be looked at during that. We're considering the regulatory framework across the whole piece. We would like to see um, how that will work in terms of promoting competition, innovation and also the public consumer interest. So we are looking at all of this and um, we are expecting <coughs> the chair of the independent report to produce the report in the autumn. Thank you. That uh, concludes portfolio questions. I apologise to three members I was unable to call for reasons I know you understand.